Um, Great. Well, I'm so happy to be here tonight. I really am in this intimate group and we are with Amy Rose White and um, I already had my gushing moment, but I, you know, Amy Rose White is very well known and well versed in this beautiful space of um, maternal newborn or maternal mental health <laughs> it comes with newborns and pregnancy and we are um honoring in may which we're in the middle of um maternal wellness um, month so we think connect our community partner tonight so amy rose moved to park city this year from sugar house and she um before that was in eugene oregon and she ha is a perinatal psychotherapist in private practice. She specializes in trauma recovery and she counsels both um, couples and mamas through their journey. And Amy Rose is a very, very soulful, intuitive healer. And I know that she has really, um, she's a teacher and she's a student and she's a friend and she's a mama herself and has been in this um, in this business for over 25 years. So it is really such an honor to have her with us tonight. Thank you so much, Amy Rose. Thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. <clears throat> I really appreciate it and I'm honored to be here. So again, feel free to ask questions at any time. And I'll I'm gonna talk for 20, 30 minutes if no one asks questions and then we'll go and and have a dialogue about anything else that comes up and I can go into more details. Uh, so as you noted, yes, um, my expertise is in perinatal families, perinatal mental health, meaning pregnancy, the first couple of years postpartum, or at least through the end of nursing, if that's taking place and anything reproductive health related. So that could be including miscarriage, loss, child death, abortion, et cetera. Um, and although I have a lot of experience and I've been doing that for 15 years as a therapist and working with perinatal families in their homes before that for many years, <clears throat> my, my knowing comes quite honestly <laughs> as a mom who struggled big time and was not prepared despite my graduate education for all of that. So I'm going to tell just a nutshell version of my story because it highlights some of the misnomers around um, emotional wellness around the perinatal period and um, as a good kind of segue into understanding basically what to expect when you're expecting a postpartum in what's in the range of normal for you and when to be more concerned about yourself or someone you love when should your partner if you have a partner be concerned when to seek more support so my goal today is to make sure that you have a general understanding of what to expect what things really look like because there's a lot of misnomers when it comes to emotional health uh, around motherhood and parenthood and then where to go what to do how to both prevent and support ourselves when we end up having some of these symptoms which um, depression and anxiety are actually the most common complication of childbirth are more prevalent than preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, all the things that we treat and screen and educate around during pregnancy. So that's why it's my passion because I had no idea about that. I actually worked on a labor and delivery floor during my last year of graduate school, which was my entire pregnancy from my first child. And I learned nothing about this. <laughs> So the rest of my life basically has been devoted to gathering knowledge, understanding more about what was happening for me so that I could better serve um, perinatal families that hopefully wouldn't have to go through the same thing. So the nutshell version for me is I had a planned unplanned pregnancy. I, we knew we wanted um, children, but that pregnancy came a little sooner than we anticipated. Um, it was not an easy pregnancy. There was a lot of high stress. Um, and a really difficult traumatic delivery, um, resulting in a brain injury for my little guy that took us kind of years to figure out. So in during my pregnancy, when they screened me for history, I did have a very significant history of depression. So the reason I'm telling you that is it's a risk factor, and it's really important to know what your risk factors are. 
So I had a history of PMS, which no one asked me about, but that's a risk factor that indicates that our brains are sensitive to hormonal fluctuation, which as you can imagine, getting pregnant is a really big hormone change. <laughs> and then having a baby is a really big hormone change because all those hormones go back down to pre-pregnancy levels within 72 hours, with the exception of prolactin if you choose to nurse or are able to nurse. Incidentally, that hormone prolactin and oxytocin are protective for the brain for people who are at risk. So if people are able to and choose to nurse or chest feed, that can be protective if it's going well. If it's not going well, and there's a lot of pain and stress, um, you know, nipple degradation, all that stuff, then it can be an additional risk factor. So I'll cover more of that as we go along, but that's just something to take note of. What I was told during my pregnancy was, oh, you had depression as an adolescent, you were on antidepressants for 12 years, you're at very high risk for postpartum depression, period. <laughs> There's nothing else. There wasn't like what to do or how to prepare or what it might look like. I was just kind of like, good luck to you. This could definitely happen. So I basically just crossed my fingers and lo and behold, after this very difficult delivery, I did not feel depressed. I did not feel anything like I had in the past. And I thought I had dodged that bullet. But what I did have were most of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder for many months that then reoccurred when I got pregnant for the second time and realized I was gonna have to do that again. <laughs> um, so I walked around kind of in a daze. I felt like I was in a dream. I cried anytime I thought about the birth or someone asked me about it. My graduate school colleagues and social work school would come to visit me and the baby and kind of not know what to say to me as I just like cried trying to talk about um, the birth. So that kind of eased itself away over the course of a year, but I also had a baby that because of his injuries um, was neurologically divergent and did not sleep really quite literally up every hour. So I was worried and I was anxious and I was like tabulating all of his feedings from beginning to end and had no idea that that was outside the norm. Certainly outside the norm for me, but I was a brand new mom, thought maybe this was normal for being a new mom and later realized that it really was not. I became pregnant with my second towards the end of the pregnancy. I started yelling. I started feeling angry, irritable. I became like this mom that went from exactly how I thought I should be parenting to someone that was kind of unrecognizable, but a little familiar when I looked at my own childhood. So in my mind, I just thought, oh gosh, you've become just like your mom. You're terrible at this. You shouldn't have had these kids. You know, what were you thinking? Because I didn't feel depressed. So the first thing that I want to communicate to you is that the term postpartum depression is something of a misnomer. Most women, not all, but most women that have emotional health complications don't really feel depressed. Some do feel detached from their baby, but it's not the vast majority. Anger, irritability, rage, anxiety, overwhelm, racing thoughts, difficulty sleeping. These are the more common characteristics of perinatal depression and anxiety. And there's an agitated, anxious component to mood issues that require medical treatment. Now, that doesn't mean antidepressants, it just means more support. And we're gonna, I'm gonna go over all the many multimodal treatments um, and strategies for both preventing and treating these if they should happen to you or someone that you care about. But that said, you know, how we paint postpartum depression in the media is if a mom that doesn't love her baby, feels really disconnected, wants to hurt her baby, wants to hurt herself. Those can be symptoms of other things and they can be part of postpartum depression, but they're, they're not the predominant. It's an anxious, anxiety-ridden, agitated depression, most predominantly, and irritability. So if a partner says, I don't know who this person is anymore, that is a warning sign um, that something is not right for you. So the, the best thing that a person can think about when it comes to knowing when to get more support is do I feel like myself? And yeah, a couple first six weeks of adjusting to new parenthood, you are going to feel out of sorts. But if after those first two, three weeks, you are continuing to feel anxious, overwhelmed, not sleeping, people tell you to sleep when the baby sleeps and you can't, you're irritable all the time at your partner, things that you used to love do not, you know, they don't elicit joy for you at all. Um, these are indicators of something that falls in the postpartum depression anxiety category. 
I'm just gonna pause here. Are there any questions at this moment before I talk about some of the other kind of diagnoses that we think about, but don't um, in the perinatal health world, but we don't talk about much in our culture? Um, well, first of all, a comment. I just, I, I love what you're um, divulging in terms of like the perception because you hurt, I mean, an older term is like baby blues, right? So you assume that people are down, right? A more of this depression, this postpartum depression, but that anxiety and irritability can, can obviously be incredibly potent factors for people to deal with. Um, I have a question about if you never deal with it, like does, do you f find or statistically, does it continue for years? Or is it a self-limiting process? You know, kids get, they, when they get more of a sleep routine and then the parents are getting a better, better sleep, do you find that that resolves somewhat? Or what do you expect in those scenarios? Thanks, great question, Joanna. So it's hard to capture statistically. It's difficult to do research on cohort populations um, while controlling for all the variables that go into treating or not treating. So it's a hard question to answer from a research perspective. Empirically, and what's generally known, um, meaning anecdotally just from working with people, sorry, sometimes I get my sciencey brain on. <laughs> um, we, what we see is a very high likelihood of becoming long-term maternal depression. So when the symptoms kind of linger, even if it's just some of them, or maybe it's gotten better, um, untreated longer term maternal depression will still really influence someone's functioning. They're just out of the year postpartum window. So it just, it becomes chronic essentially. And what I see is especially for people who are more sensitive to hormone fluctuations and sleep deprivation, particularly if they have multiple children, those symptoms get progressively worse. Now in the literature, it says that it's worse with the first child. That has never been my experience in working with thousands of women at this point. Um, so, you know, again, the question of how well we are able to capture data accurately is a difficult one to tackle in this field. Um, however, yes, for some of the illnesses uh, or the emotional health conditions, people do find that after a year or two, they feel more like themselves, but the vast majority will not feel completely kind of back to normal pre-kids, um, even after their children have left the house. And my theory about that is, um, again, that's not everyone, but my theory is that the endocrine system has to deal in modern life with so many more toxins and stressors than we did even 25 years ago because I'm seeing dysregulated, like really severe PMS in very young women now. Um, I'm seeing severe, more severe postpartum depression that lasts longer in very young women. And so my theory is that our endocrine systems cannot catch up. They haven't have evolved basically to be able to handle the amount of stress and stress, as you probably all know, it causes inflammation in the body. And inflammation is a key um, characteristic of all these emotional health conditions. So one of the best prevention tools and intervention strategies is to throw everything anti-inflammatory at the situation. And by that, I mean, relaxation, yoga, um, meditation, hypnotherapy, fish oils, um, uh, if you choose to take antidepressants, those are anti-inflammatory, as are a whole host of new nutrients like magnesium, selenium, B6. Um, I'm an integrative psychotherapist, so I do a lot of recommendations around nutrition. Um, progesterone is anti-inflammatory. I'm seeing a lot of young women on bioidentical progesterone. Uh, women that have histories of postpartum depression, we don't have a lot of good research on it, but some of them are respond very well to bioidentical uh, progesterone, perinatally uh, pregnancy and postpartum. So it's important to catch it because it does not typically tend to completely resolve. Um, it, it tends to get a little better over time, but again, it depends on the woman. Some, some people continue with really severe chronic symptoms, but they think it's their new normal and they just kind of continue in that space. So that's my mission is to let women know, do not settle for that. It's not good enough. We want to get you actually th thriving in parenthood, not just barely making it. And then, so you've, you've talked about several risk factors, some being 
hormonal. Um, and I wonder in your experience, are there certain personality types, like people who are highly sensitive? Obviously there are, there are people who are sensitive to hormones, but in terms of personality types that you notice that are more at risk. Yeah. So this has been studied in, in the research and um, although the HSP personality, if that's what you're referring to, the highly sensitive person, I have not necessarily seen that studied in the literature. What has been is people who have um, tendencies towards perfectionism, um, very high standards, um, any OCD in the family, even if that just means like a desire to have things just so, um, the more rigid people's sort of belief structures are and thought structures are like a real need um, to hold themselves to a certain standard, to have things just so, um, difficulty responding to change, um, inflexibility, those types of personalities are much, much higher risk, as you can imagine, because nothing but mother, you know, there's nothing like motherhood to test um, <laughs> the ability to adapt to changing in circumstances. <laughs> it's like constant, you know, it's like yeah, my kids are now almost 19 and almost 17. And I feel like every day I never know, you know, what's, what's going to happen. And they have their own lives and jobs. And <laughs> I'm still, you know, like, it's just, you'll get a call in the middle of the night. So, um, although the physical demands are not there, I think there's something in our brains that gets turned on once we're parents that are, it's, there's always something to respond to. So if you would have a difficulty with that and there's a resistance to responding to in the moment and letting surrendering basically our expectations of how things are gonna look. You know, for me personally, really briefly, I thought I would read to this baby all the time and he'd be this super smart kid who would love to go to story time and um, he'd listen to me and my degree in, in child development and all my work with kids in the child welfare system, like this is gonna be a cakewalk. Well, none of it worked, none of it. He was a spirited child that did not sleep and did not listen to me. He still doesn't. <laughs> you know, like I asked him to help me with something outside today. He's like, I'm doing something, you know, like he'll help me on his own time. That's just, that's just him. Um, and he's wonderful and bright and amazing, but he, I had to grieve and let go the image of who I wanted him to be and who I thought he was going to be. So as you know, mothering is like this constant birth and death process. It's a constant grieving. I did want to touch on the word baby blues. So that is something that gets women in hot water. And a lot of providers, unfortunately, will tell women outside the two week, three week postpartum window, oh, it's just baby blues. If you are not feeling like yourself after the first two or three weeks, it's not the baby blues anymore. You wanna see an upward trajectory in that two, three week window. If you're seeing more sleeplessness, more anxiety, more overwhelm, um, that is becoming something that requires more support. Anything else before I carry on? Okay, thanks for the great questions. So diagnostically, we do have this depression diagnosis, but if you are not feeling like yourself, you wanna see someone, whether it's your midwife, your OB, a perinatal therapist that really has education in understanding that you could be just obsessively in love with your baby and not sleeping and having all these racing thoughts and have postpartum anxiety or depression. So it's really important to reach out for help if you're not feeling like yourself and work with someone that knows what they're doing. Hello. And what the other kind of complications that we can think about or like look for would be in the panic family, like lots of racing um, heart rate, feeling overwhelmed, maybe like fear of um, there's kids around D Y I N G, um, um, you know, thoughts like that's, what's happening to me right now. Cause my heart is racing. That's something we call panic disorder. If it's happening really frequently, that's it falls in the class of anxiety disorders responds really well to hydration, magnesium, um, nutritional support. And of course, sometimes medication, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the birth trauma PTSD is something that's obviously near and dear to my heart because I experienced it. That is really um, covers kind of three main domains, avoiding reminders of the child, a childbirth, um, feeling what we call hyper aroused, which is sort of like 
jumping at loud noises, easily startled. Um, and then, oh, <laughs> oh boy, Mercury retrogrades getting my brain. Intrusion, intrusion symptoms. So avoidance, arousal, and intrusion. <laughs> Yay, brain, it came back. So, <laughs> so those intrusion symptoms, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Those intrusion symptoms are when like, you just can't stop thinking about it, basically, the bad thing that happened. And, you know, we used to think that PTSD only happened to, to war veterans. We now know that anyone who experiences um, an event that to them they perceive as a threat to their personal or emotional, psychological, physical integrity, or someone they love, like they're worried about their baby, for instance, who's in the NICU, um, can have the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you find that thinking about the birth, you're, you're avoiding reminders, you feel like agitated all the time, um, and then you have this sort of intrusion, thinking about things you don't want to think about related to something scary that's happened. Um, you can also have memories of other traumas that have happened to you in your life that are evoked by having the baby. So that's kind of what PTSD looks like perinatally. And then I wanted to highlight two other kind of diagnoses today that we all need to know about, not because I'm interested in diagnosing people, but because when you have these symptoms and you don't know what they are, women really think that they are losing their minds. Um, and they're afraid to disclose what's happening for them because they're afraid of having their children taken away. So the number one there is um, postnatal or perinatal obsessive compulsive disorder. So for some women that can be constantly cleaning the bottles, lining everything up, needing baby food in a certain order, that's it's I've seen it, it happens. Um, any person who has a proclivity to kind of ruminating thoughts or checking things is at higher risk, particularly for this, or maybe they have um, family members that, you know, maybe even it's sort of like tongue in cheek. People say, oh, aunt so-and-so has, she's so OCD, but maybe she hasn't like actually been diagnosed with that. Those are all risk factors for having, um, and I'm gonna, because there's, there's a newly postpartum friend here with us today, I'm gonna, not gonna give a ton of details because our brains are really suggestible um, around that time. But perinatal OCD often involves intrusive thoughts of harm, of harm coming to people you love, including the baby, and often even at the mom's own hands. So I'm not gonna go into any details, but I will say that women who have that illness are tortured by having intrusive, unwanted thoughts that don't make sense to them, that they don't plan on acting on, that they can't get the images out of their mind. It's kind of like you see a pink elephant, people say, don't think about a pink elephant, and all you can think about is pink elephant, pink elephant, pink elephant. <laughs> Um, now that is a sign of a neurochemical imbalance that responds really well to something called exposure and prevention therapy. So exposure is basically a, supporting you in not avoiding the images or the behaviors that you think are related to some of these scary thoughts. So if you had a thought of, let's just say, a pink elephant's going to sit on my baby. Let's just use that one. It's pretty benign. I've never seen one, um, <laughs> then maybe you would like avoid circuses or something <laughs> like, you know, so the therapy would be like, go to the circus and meet a, a pink elephant and hold your baby and prove to yourself that you're fine. Because what we say is if the thoughts bother you, you're not at risk of doing any harm. So now let's touch on kind of every mom's worst fear, you know, harming her baby in all, but very, very rare circumstances where there's usually extreme drug abuse and alcohol abuse involved, um, <clears throat> or a, a really sociopathic personality disorder that's very rare. Um, when you see scary footage of bad things happening to babies by the hands of their moms on the news, they are having an episode of postpartum psychosis. And psychosis is happens to about one to 2% of all women. And it is related to bipolar disorder. So if women have that diagnosis, they are at higher risk. They need to have their sleep protected and it's preventable because we kind of know that's a known risk factor. But when women harm their babies, they are in a state in their brain uh, divergent from reality. And they usually believe that what they're doing for their baby is helping them in some way, saving them from some, something. They often have religious themes. So um, again, 
either significant sociopathy or drug and alcohol abuse. And even then, I think that's much rarer than a psychotic episode where a woman just is literally not in her right mind. So those women have thoughts that don't bother them. It makes sense to them. There, there may be violent images or graphic images. So if you, if you or someone you know has scary thoughts and are bothered by them, it is completely safe to talk to an educated professional. I wouldn't just waltz into any emergency room and talk about that symptom. Full disclosure, it does not always go well because a medical professional that does not know about that illness can overreact and have um, a traumatizing response. That said, I personally have devoted the last 10 years of my life living here to educating the entire Utah population through an organization I used to run called P Postpartum Support International Utah to help more and more medical professionals know what these things are so that that doesn't happen. I'm not taking all the credit for that. I'm just saying that I there's a lot of people in this state that now know, have the information and are spreading that information. Um, so that kind of covers all the like scary stuff that I wanted to be sure. It's like, you know, you get scared about preeclampsia, you get scared about gestational diabetes. These things aren't scary because they're actually preventable and treatable. If we know our risk factors and we know what to look for and we get help earlier rather than later. So before I talk about like what treatment looks like for five minutes or so, are there any questions at this point? I'm interested to know, as you've talked about uh, several strategies that can help treat um, some of these um, pathologies, but if you were, um, you know, a, a new mom listening to this and it's like, I don't necessarily have, um, maybe that they haven't given birth yet and they wanna be protective or they've, they've delivered and they're having a normal trajectory, but they don't want to decline. Are there like a certain, like say like a top three things you find are the most important in terms of being protective against some of these conditions that we're talking about, whether it would be magnesium or fish oil or sleep or exercise, you know, what is, what are your go-to kind of the general population before anyone's gone into that decline or the, those certain um, conditions? Mm -hmm. My top three would be sleep. So the goal is four to six hours as soon as you're able. Now we all know no newborn baby gives you that, or at least very few. <laughs> I, I was not lucky enough to have one of those miracle children. Um, so sometimes when I say that one lactation, people get a little because they say, well, you know, we need to feed when the baby needs to feed, which I totally agree. Um, however, if you're starting to have symptoms and you're nursing every two hours or three hours because you just have a frequent nurser or a baby who's cluster feeding because they're going through a growth spurt or what have you, it's really important to get on the front end of that. Because if too many months go by and you're not feeling like yourself, it can be just that much harder to recover. So notice, I would say noticing how you respond to sleep deprivation, knowing that ahead of time, most of us know, like, can I go camping for three nights and feel normal when I come back or does it take me a week to recover, you know? Um, and after the first baby, we kind of learn a lot about our sleep patterns and what we need. So getting four hours in a row, at least three nights a week is a great prevention strategy. The way most people accomplish that once baby is feeding well, however that's going, whether that's bottle feeding or nursing is to have ideally, and this is much harder for single parents, um, a support person that takes the first half of the night. And then mom goes to bed in a separate room with earplugs, eye, um, eye mask and a sound machine. So that's my biggest intervention and prevention strategy. The second would be nutrition, protein and fat at every snack and meal, having someone set up a plate with little, whether, whether she's vegan, it's avocados, almonds, whatever, you know, sometimes there's sensitivities to babies have to nuts. So it gets complicated, but you know, basically what she can eat and likes put in small amounts on a couple plates. So she doesn't have to make food for basically the first three months throughout the day. Like, a mom, if she's had other kids, is busy like nibbling, you know, cheese it's off the floor and, you know, whatever falls off the, um, gosh, what is this called? The high chair. So, so, you know, that's keeping insulin level stable and hydration and food. That would be number two. 
Because if you get your blood sugar going like this, you're going to be more anxious. You're going to be more panicky. You're going to be more irritable. All those things that can mimic anxiety and depression, but they're really about your insulin and um, nourishing your system, staying on your prenatal, adding high dose fish oils. Absolutely. And then the third, so I kind of keep that all in the like nutrition hydration is one thing to me. And then um, thirdly would be social support, making sure that at least once a day you're texting a friend and ideally once a week, seeing someone in person um, and having an adult conversation. So really like keeping your circle, creating a circle, postpartum.net, you can click on any state in the country and most countries in the world and find volunteer support coordinators that lead free support groups in your area. You know, you're on, I'm sure the PSI's website, um, Hive is, I would hope it is, if it's not, let's make sure it is. Um, and, and, or talk to free support coordinators who can just connect you to resources in your community, or just set you up with a mentor mom to be your friend, basically, who's gone through um, postpartum challenges and gotten through it. So that social support piece is absolutely huge for, for prevention and for treatment. Does that answer your question? Okay. So in a general sense, what I just covered is the um, most evidence-based treatment and the least invasive that I start with in my practice. So quite frankly, people end up paying a lot of money and taking time to see me for me to tell them those three things I just told you, because they're not commonly known. And I'm going to be sending you a handout that Sarah's going to get and Joanne's going to get to everyone, um, or maybe on your website called Sunshine, which I helped the Department of Public Health in Utah create. It goes over these recommendations around sleep, nutrition, hydration, social support, um, sunshine, exercise is huge. It's just, if I had to pick three, I reduced it to those. Um, <clears throat> basically kind of the fundamentals of self-care that are the first things to go out the window when we have a kid. So those are interventions like you, if you're dehydrated, you can have a panic attack. You can and, and, and will, if you're at risk for that. High dose fish oils absolutely have been shown to be very helpful. Um, in general, a good B complex, a food based prenatal, I encourage women to be on really until their 40s and even 50s because, um, unless they don't need the iron, because the B complex vitamins that are more prolific and high, their higher amounts in the prenatals, those are what we call cofactors to the neurochemicals, the brain chemicals that we need to feel balanced and even. So those are serotonin dopamine and norepinephrine. And if you're not getting enough B vitamins because you're stressed and your body's not absorbing them, which most new moms are pretty stressed, or you don't have time to eat a ton of kale, you know, smoothies every day or salads. Um, and even then we might not be getting all the nutrients because our soil has been so depleted, even if you're getting all organic. So a supplemental B complex is really, really important. And then other ways to treat are the amino acid family. Those are precursors to those three neurochemicals that I just talked about. So SAMe, 5-HTP, L-tyrosine, L-theanine. These are all evidence-based treatments for general depression and anxiety. They haven't been super well studied in perinatal populations specifically. We don't have a ton of data on them during nursing and pregnancy. So the naturopathic functional medicine world will say, um, yes, absolutely no very limited side effects. We see good outcomes. I personally took 5-HTP during and after my entire pregnancy with my second child. Um, he's, you know, seems fine. <laughs> he's a brilliant, brilliant kid. You know, what, what, do you, what do I know? But it, for me, the benefits outweighed any risk because I could not expose him to the untreated illness. So that brings me to that point. If we try to muscle through these symptoms because we don't want to expose our kids. I personally had a chronic pain condition when I was pregnant with my first child, Max, and I was so religious about never exposing him to anything. I didn't even take a single ibuprofen. Now I know that I was flooding that kid with cortisol because of the amount of pain I was in, which is way worse than if I had just taken some ibuprofen now and then. So I wasn't in crippling pain that entire pregnancy. Um, so the benefits outweigh the risks. If you're having something that isn't just responding to sleep, nutrition, hydration, and social support, 
in my book. Um, what we do have a lot of data on are the antidepressants, the Zoloft, the Lexapros, the Prozacs of the world. There's a lot to choose from. Zoloft is typically the one that's most often prescribed to pregnant and nursing women. Did I lose you? Oh, I hope not. Oh, if we're still recording. No, I'm here. I'm okay, here. good. Okay, good. There's just me, pros on my end. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Zoloft, Zoloft is um, almost undetectable in the blood plasma levels of infants um, during pregnancy and lactation. So, you know, if you go talk to a doctor about these symptoms, they will usually suggest that. Um, lots of them are available. None of them um, go to the baby in amounts that we believe are unsafe. If you take something like this during pregnancy, um, there can be some ab some neo we call it neonatal withdrawal syndrome, abstinence syndrome for babies that last about three days at the longest. They tend to be a little um, lower muscle tone, a little more tired. Maybe it's harder to nurse in a, in a small percentage of babies that does happen. It, it resolves on its own in a short period of time. And again, that's like a cost benefit ratio. So when you're thinking about getting help, you have all these things, fish oils, amino acid therapy, which again, I don't, haven't seen the abstinence syndrome in the same way, but it's hard to quantify because we don't study. Um, we don't study drugs that don't make <clears throat> companies a lot of money. So unfortunately we don't have a lot of information there, but we do have a ton of data on the lower APGAR scores and developmental struggles of babies who were exposed in utero to depression and anxiety that wasn't treated. That is clear as day. There's no question that, and the impact is not good for older children's development either, or like partnership stability and all those things. When we sacrifice ourselves and say, I'm not gonna take a medicine or whatever is gonna work, um, the benefits do not outweigh the risks in that scenario. Like that is just, the jury is out on that one. So your well-being and your ability to feel like yourself is in your children's best interest. And if you reach out for help and you only get one tool from one kind of person's toolbox, keep reaching out. That's my main message today is there's so many ways to treat this, so many ways to prevent, um, so many different strategies but you deserve to feel well. And it's our, our motto at PSI is um, you're not to blame. You will be well. <laughs> gosh, oh my gosh, my brain. You're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> Thank you. You're not alone. You're not to blame. You will be well. Thank goodness Sarah's here. So yeah, you're not alone. It's the most common complication of childbirth. It's almost a quarter of all women. And it's much higher since COVID. It's the numbers are more around 60% at least. So anyone having a baby right now is like, you know, my hat is off to you. You're, you're doing this among or amidst, you know, extraordinary circumstances. So you're not alone. You're not to blame and you will be well. It's just, we want to keep really reminding people of that because there are so many options and you will find someone to help you with something that fits for you, your, and your value system and your body. Because sometimes people don't respond to medicine, but they respond really great to nutritional supplements or an exercise regime or cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy. Those are the two psychotherapeutic approaches that are most evidence-based. So I think that's kind of the general overview of maternal mental health that I wanted to cover today. Um, any other questions or thoughts? I had a question. What do you hear, see, know about um, encapsulating your placenta and, um, and taking it in postpartum? Yeah, so I'll always get that question and it's a great question and I wish we had more research. So the, the literature is not um, promising around it, but empirically it's a yes. <laughs> so I've worked with more women who said that it helped them um, that they, you know, felt so much better in the pregnancies when they took it. Um, and then in the literature, it's not, it's, there's not like a statistically significant impact. So I, it's, you know, I got to tell you both of those sides. I will say I have had lactation people say to be careful about the duration of taking, um, cups encapsulated placenta because, um, those hormones that replicate pregnancy a little bit can influence milk supply. Mm. 
And then I've had some women that have never had anything like that remotely happened and they've taken their placenta pills till they were gone. So it's, I, I, my personal view on it, based on what I've heard from working with so many women is if you're drawn to that, like it makes sense to me that since in the animal world, they do that, um, that we would, however, they eat it all at once. They don't take it for months. Right. So, um, there's just something to think about, do your own research, talk to other women, um, see if it resonates with you. It's something I wish I had done because I think just logically it makes the hormone fluctuation a slower grade. And I personally have a very hormone sensitive brain. It does not like change at all. Um, but literature wise, there, is, there isn't like the jury is it's not super clear. Yes, yet. Mm -hmm. And that might be because we have really small studies that haven't been super well designed. Um, I'm not quite sure. It needs more research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I hear and what I teach. And I was just wondering if you were, um, if you were hearing the same thing, which it sounds like you are. Yeah. Um, my other question had to do with something you said in the beginning about your story about having a history of PMS and having that link. I, I hadn't ever heard that. And so is that something, um, if you, you know, either in your own story or what you know, is that PMS, um, like physical cramping is that mood fluctuation. I mean, PMS is, is like yeah, yeah. It's kind of an umbrella anyway. So raising a daughter, I guess I'm just curious because I didn't know anything about that. If you could just speak to that for a sec. Yeah, really good question. So when it comes to mood complications related to pregnancy and postpartum, it's PMS that influences mood that appears to be most, most related or and or intolerance to birth control pills. So if I get a client and I say, you know, how do you respond emotionally and physically? Cause I want to know both to birth control pills and she gets, oh my gosh, I've been on 10 of them. I can't do it. I have an IUD that's non-hormonal or I use the natural cycles app. Like that's the worst, or I could only tolerate this tiny little bit of progesterone only birth control pill. That's like a, you know, red flag for me. <laughs> so sensitivity to birth control pills emotionally and PMS emotionally, even if it's significant, but maybe for like two to three days. Um, that is something, again, I'm seeing with more and more young women who have multiple children is their PMS starts to get longer and even evolve into PMDD. Um, I will give a shout out for a non-postpartum related book that I just feel, since you mentioned having a daughter, that I think is wonderful that I'm failing to see right now in my bevy of books. It's called the period repair manual. Oh, I'm really hoping I can find it, but I don't see it. It's bright pink. Um, in any case, it's by Dr. Lara Brighton, the period repair manual. And she talks a lot about using nutrition to regulate PMS and women's mood. She doesn't talk a ton about postpartum, but I, I use a lot of her treatment regimes with my postpartum clients um, because they are uh, small amounts of vitamins that are compatible with nursing and pregnancy. And women seem to respond really, really well. Um, for those of us over 40, she also wrote a book called the hormone repair manual, which is, um, a godsend. It's amazing. So she's a New Zealand functional medicine doctor. Um, but yeah, we're generally talking about how has your mood responded? How's your mood responded to a miscarriage after an abortion, after, you know, a loss. What, what did your body and your mood do? And the more you get a positive, like, ugh, it was terrible. I didn't feel like myself for so long. The more information you have indicating a hormone sensitive brain that is not going to like that sharp, sharp decline, um, in hormones following either at the beginning of pregnancy, some women immediately don't feel like themselves. I've heard women tell me that they had intrusive thoughts within the first two weeks of having um, a positive pregnancy test. So it just depends on the woman because more typically we'll hear those symptoms in the third trimester when estrogen and progesterone are at the very highest. And then in the first couple of weeks to few months, um, particularly once nursing has stopped. Like for me, I limped along until 18 months, my second child, I weaned him. And then it was like toast. Like I needed brain support. I'd like the little bit of prolactin that was saving me from like losing it completely <laughs> was gone. And then I got, then I got on the amino 
what did I do? I don't even remember, but um, I think I'd gone off and I got back on and it was a long time ago. But in any case, um, I could feel viscerally that once I didn't have that prolactin in my brain anymore, um, there was not enough biological support and I needed to support my adrenals. It's a whole nother topic, but that's, you know, that's something that's getting shot for women. It's like their stress chemicals are just going on and on and on because of sleep deprivation and the demands of child rearing and their adrenal glands, which influence the parts of our brain that make all those mood chemicals. It's called the HPA axis and our brain gets really thrown off. So sleep, nutrition, hydration, breaks from baby on a regular basis and some even temporary brain support. You know, if you go on an amino acid or an antidepressant, typically we say six to 12 months and then see if you can wean off and a good chunk of women are able to stop completely. I think because of my own personal history, I'm just someone who's gonna be on something the rest of my life. Um, I take personally 5-HTP and L-tyrosine every single day. I took SAMe for a very long period of time. That's what I took after my postpartum experience and it worked wonders for me. Um, one of my kids responded very well to it around their depression around puberty. That's just something, unfortunately, that's in my family. So not all women will be that way, but some have even had low level depression they didn't recognize. And once they treat it, they feel better than they have even in their whole life. I've seen that more than a handful of times. How long, when, when you start um, implementing these strategies with women, how long do you suggest that they take these before assessing if they're having changes? So it depends on, on the strategy. Um, do you mean supplementation and medicine specific, specifically? Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, because with certain medications sometimes, and it can be supplements too, you know, you might need to time for accumulation to happen within your system. And so, you know, I didn't know if you say, you know, try these, take them for a week, or is it, do people feel pretty quickly? Um, especially with neurotransmitters, I imagine that people would feel that quickly, but I don't know. So great question. So that's why I'm a big fan of the amino acid therapy family. One is because its side effect profile is very, very low. Um, the discomfort that people have with amino acid therapy, um, and SAMI is not quite an amino acid, but it is a precursor to serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. You get all three in one with that supplement. 5-HTP is one molecule away from pure serotonin. And that's the neurochemical that Zoloft, Prozac, Lexapro, Paxil, all those get more to your brain, but the mechanism of action is different. So with the amino acids, they work very quickly and you can do what we call titration sooner. So you can go up. That's a fancy word for going up um, within even five days to seven days. So usually people will bump up a whole nother like hundred milligrams, say, or 50 milligrams of 5-HTP every week until they notice a difference. In the antidepressant class, most providers will want them to wait four to six weeks. When I'm working with someone, I always advocate for faster than that because we now know that people can and do respond to antidepressants within a two to three week window. And time is money when it comes to this, the stakes are very high, right? Like our bonding, our connection with other kids, our partner, it can be damage very quickly if we suffer needlessly for a long time. And usually by the time people come to me, they have not been like themselves for a really long time. Sometimes they've seen multiple providers before they get to me. So um, in that case, what I say is I'd like you to talk to your provider and I'm happy to speak with them um, about going up at, in three or four weeks um, and seeing, I mean, going low and slow makes sense because some people's brains just need a tiny amount of the medicine and some people need a whole lot. Um, but it does tend to take longer with the antidepressant class with things like sleep. I mean, a few nights sleep, if it's going to make a difference for someone makes a big difference right away. Now they might feel more fatigued, but they'll feel like more like themselves also. So they're like tired, but they don't feel as angry, irritable, anxious, overwhelmed. Um, this, this nutritional supplements take more like two to three months to make a big difference. Um, the bioidentical hormones take a while, depends on what that is. I should note that at least 10% of women will develop a thyroid condition after having a baby. And that can mimic some of these. It can, hypothyroidism can look like depression. Hyperthyroidism can look like anxiety. So again, just really important to get blood work, lab work done 
at your, um, the six week checkup is so soon, you know, but three months, six months for sure. If you're not feeling like yourself, you want to get all that done. Um, but the amino acids, people respond quite quickly. That's why I really like them. You can have some GI upset. That's about it. This is so informative. Oh yeah, go low. I have one more question. Yeah. So, as far as local resources, what is available here? I know the Hive and their resources. I know PSI, but I don't know what's available here and what else is available too. Yeah, great question. So since COVID, there's a lot more resources online. Um, the Healing Group is a perinatal um, mental health organization, uh, like a private therapy practice in Salt Lake. Um, we have a, an intensive outpatient program at St. Mark's Hospital, which is a day treatment program. Women actually take their babies for a very few period of, oh, maybe do they? I don't count on that. I can't remember. I think they get to take their babies just for a few hours. So that is um, a place that has free support groups and more intensive intervention for people that need like they're one step away from going into the hospital, basically. That's something to know about. Um, Serenity Wellness and Recovery is just in Lehigh, I believe, or yeah, maybe on the border of Salt Lake and Lehigh. Um, they also have an intensive outpatient program and just outpatient services for perinatal women, and they run support groups. And then if you go to postpartum.net and you hit Utah, um, well, actually, there's just general support groups and specific online support groups that anyone from any state can attend through the postpartum.net website. And then you'll see all the lists, um, the list of all the resources in Utah around in-person and online resources um, through those different community partners. There might be some that I'm unaware of because I haven't checked it in about a year, um, but those are the ones that come to my mind in terms of free support um, and also just um, perinatal therapy services where all the therapists are trained. On the PSI website under Utah, you'll also see all the therapists that have postpartum support international training um, similar to mine and um, are just, they're either coordinators that, that can give you free information and support, hook you up to a mentor mom, or find a therapist that has the right training and bills your insurance or you know whatever you're looking for. I mean, there could be more, <laughs> um, but it's a good start for Utah. I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting something really important. Is him, it's him, he, what used to be uni at the University of Utah Hospital. Now it's Huntsman you know, Mental Health Institute. They have a free support group in their downtown location um, that's also listed on the PSI website. Yeah, I love that last question, Lo, because that's exactly what I was going to um, have Amy Rose speak to as well, because I think you said it earlier, but I know the importance of sending people to an educated professional, and especially when it comes to postpartum, because as you mentioned, you know, some of these um, you know, symptoms and issues are very specific to perinatal um, period. And so I really appreciate I appreciate that. And um, just one more service to add to that also is reach counseling. And oh, yeah. um, Ashley Henderson has um, was a speaker of ours this year and has something on Hive Family Collective. And um, and yeah, I just I, I and also always you can reach out to Hive and we can help you find because I know sometimes I have mamas who know that it's out there, but that even feels daunting. And so, um, you know, I'm um, 17 years postpartum, <laughs> like Amy Rose, my kids are a little older. <laughs> so happy to help in any way. But um, I think we're going to wrap up and I just want to honor time and I just want to honor you and our guests for all those that are listening. Thank you so much for joining us and low to you and your beautiful family. Um, thank you for joining us. And Amy Rose, thank you so much. This, I always learn a lot from you and um, really leaves me with a lot of hope. It really does. It, it really does because our mamas, they are not alone and um, and we, we are here for them. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Okay, perfect. Have a good night. You too, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Maria, talk about a well 